Last time we were talking about population growth rates, we talked about age structure diagrams, we talked about uh, ways that uh, India and China attempted to slow their population growth rates, which they did do. Uh, we mentioned the idea of economic development as a methodology for lowering birth rates. So we're going to expand on that idea in this video. Economic development improves human well-being by making food, shelter, physical and economic security, and good health care accessible to more people. This concept is going to pull on a lot of ideas that we've already discussed, so hopefully you've, you've watched all of the videos in this unit up to this point, because we're going to talk about something called the demographic transition. As countries industrialize, as they gain more access to technology, as they develop their infrastructure, as individuals have more access to job options or educational opportunities, as per capita income rises, as income inequality is mitigated, there's, there's less of a gap between the ultra wealthy and the poor, population growth naturally begins to slow on its own without needing to enact any kind of state policies. This happens in four stages. The demographic transition happens in four stages, starting with what we call pre-industrial, moving up into something called industrializing, where we're in the active process of adding new technology, of developing infrastructure, of creating new educational and, and employment opportunities. And then we move into an industrial uh, economy, and then we have what's called post-industrial. Each one of these stages is characterized by different levels of technological access as well as uh, other social reforms, but you can actually see the transition in these stages if you are looking at just the birth rates and the death rates. You can actually watch the transition happen. So in order to understand this next graph, uh, you're going to want to understand some of the material from uh, earlier on in the course when we were talking about the ways that humans have decreased their death rate and raised their carrying capacity. So at stage one, the pre-industrial stage, right, this is where all humans were at some point, right? Uh, this is before the Industrial Revolution. All humans were at the pre-industrial stage. The population grows very, very slowly because even though the birth rate is high, the, the value of children is really, really high. People are having big families. Families are having, you know, six kids, seven kids, something like that. The infant mortality rate will also be really high because in the pre-industrial stage, we do not have vaccines. We do not have antibiotics. We do not have access to, to good health care or good health care technologies of any sort. Uh, there is less technology available to grow abundant amounts of food, so there may be uh, starvation. So although the birth rate is very high, the death rate is high enough to match it, and therefore overall population growth will be slow at stage one, pre-industrial stage. At stage two, though, and this is why the human population growth rate skyrocketed during the Industrial Revolution at the transitional point, population grows rapidly because the birth rate remains unchanged. However, the death rate drops because of improved food production and health, all those factors that we talked about. Improved sanitation, improved healthcare technologies, improved food production. They removed all of those factors that were causing early mortality, and our birth rate was unchanged. It was the same. So our population growth rate skyrocketed. And you can see that here on this chart. The birth rate remains high, the death rate drops, and then the total population skyrockets in a J-shaped curve. When we hit stage three, industrial, where we have a fully functioning industrial economy. So this is based on factory work, on manufacturing. We're using a lot of machine labor. Uh, less of the economy is based on uh, agrarian systems, so less, less based on farming, on family farms, on using manual labor in order to produce economic value. Uh, then the population growth begins to slow because birth rates drop to begin to match that death rate. So you can see that here on this chart, the red line that represents birth rate starts to fall as we transition into an industrial economy. And once again, at stage four, 
post-industrial, the birth rate now matches the death rate, so the overall growth is going to be very, very slow. And you can see in this green population line, we start out low, J-shaped exponential growth curve up, but then uh, we start getting towards that industrial economy, population growth slows down, and we hit some sort of carrying capacity, right? We, where we don't really need more kids, or, or they're not as, the, the incentive to have really, really large families is not as big, so maybe just have one or two kids per family. And then the population growth staggers, and then in the post-industrial economy, the birth rate might actually fall beneath the death rate and the population might shrink back down, which we did see in some of the age structure diagrams that we were looking at in the last video. Uh, Japan and Germany, I think, were cited examples, and they are both post-industrial economies. If you check out this link here, this is the demographic data for Sweden from 1749 up through 2010 and you can see the birth rate and the death rate mapped over that time. You can see way back in the 1750s the birth rate was was higher than the death rate but they were actually like they weren't too far off from each other so population growth would have been slow because they are similar to each other and they kind of bounce around bounce around bounce around and then right after the 1800s the two rates begin to separate you see this gap forming in between them and since the birth rate is now higher than the death rate the population grew and then after they begin transitioning into this industrial economy and then as we get into let's see here it's right about 1920s 1930s 1940s and 50s yeah here we go here's where the lines actually begin touching is the 1980s we get into this post-industrial economy oh look at that 2000 and uh no 1998 1999 the birth rate actually dips beneath the death rate and so the population begins shrinking so you can see in this data that demographic transition happening. Birth rate and death rate both high at the beginning. Death rate drops first, birth rate follows after, and then at the very end the birth rate actually drops beneath the death rate. So when it refers to a pre-industrial society it means a, an agrarian society. That's an economy based on the producing and maintaining of food and cash crops. Subsistence farming is common where farmers are growing just enough food to get by, very little extra is being uh, sold for any kind of profit. Industrial societies are driven by the use of technology and mass production. Uh, stage three and stage four, which is post-industrial, uh, is where you start getting jobs that are not even directly tied to mass production, but other sorts of activities where you start getting large portions of your economy based on web page designers, uh, based on lawyers, based on educators, based on other types of work that some of which just wouldn't even exist. There would be no parallel for it in pre-industrial societies. Uh, this is a image trying to show some of the demographic transition that's occurred in the United States. So uh, the yellow bar graphs are 1900, how, what the state of affairs was for the United States in 1900, and the blue is what it was in 2000. So this is actually over two decades old, so it's, it's improved since then, hopefully. Um, life expectancy in 1900 was 47 years. Now it is 77 years, or in, in 2000, it was 77 years. I think that's still pretty close to what it is today. I, we haven't broken 80 years to the best of my knowledge. Some countries have. Some countries have lifespan or life expectancies past 80 years. Now, I should note, life expectancy, 47 years, that does not mean that it would have been considered strange for someone to live to the age of 70 or or live to the age uh, of 80, infant mortality was much higher in the past. So if you made it past uh, your early childhood years, there was a good chance that you would live uh, to a full, healthy, elderly lifespan. So, But the high infant mortality rate dramatically decreased the overall average life expectancy uh, and that's why it was so much lower in the past or at least part of the reason why it was so much lower in the past 
Married women working outside the home, 8% in 1900, 81% in 2000. Uh, high school graduates, 15% in 1900, 83% uh, in uh, 2000. Compulsory education would be the main thing that's affecting that. Uh, homes with flush toilets, homes with plumbing, 10% in 1900. I still find that shocking. I've given this presentation multiple times. In my head, by 1900, flush toilets would have been very common, but they weren't. 10% of homes had flush toilets in 1900. By 2000, 98% of homes had flush toilets. Homes with electricity, 2%, now 99%. People living in the suburbs, 10%, now 52%. Uh, as your book has mentioned several times, uh, as the population is increasing, it's also becoming more and more urbanized. That's another effect of industrialization, is that more of the jobs, more of the opportunities exist in large densely populated cities, so more people move into the cities, but there's not always enough room to, uh, to occupy everyone, and, and people do want to raise families in a quiet place, so there's what you get what's called suburban sprawl. People move outside of the city, and the suburban area surrounding a city takes up a much, much larger territory than the city itself. So. Um, people living in the suburbs, now 52% of our population as opposed to 10%. Hourly wage for a, a manufacturing job, so working in a warehouse, um, and I believe this is in, in some sort of semi-skilled capacity, was $3, now $15. Obviously, the minimum wage is not $15. Homicides per 100,000 people, um, 1.2 in 1900 in 1900 and 5.8 now. Now I am far from being an expert on this topic, but I would suspect that this is also strongly tied to the population uh, density uh, increasing, where more of the population is moving into the same location. If the population is more spread out, I would imagine that the overall crime rate is going to be lower because there's just fewer person-to-person -person interactions on a daily basis, whereas if everyone's clustered together, then the average crime rate would likely be higher. But like I said, I'm not an expert uh, on that, so my intuition there could be wrong. It does, however, bring up that not everything about economic development is uh, rosy. Um, it, it does slow down population growth. So this is a good way to slow down uh, population growth rates, which in a lot of left developed countries is one of the primary uh, environmental concerns as, as well as just being a, a concern about how you're going to feed people and things like that. However, uh, the more economic development uh, a society has, the more per capita environmental damage one would be responsible for. The average American is going to have a much bigger environmental footprint than the average citizen of India will. With every stage you move up this economic development ladder through this transition, the average per capita environmental footprint will increase. That'll have some implications when we get into Unit 4 and we start talking about energy resources. Now, this entire unit, I've been using certain language uh, and I've gotten away with not defining it. That is less developed country, moderately developed country, highly developed country. What do I mean when I'm saying those things? When I say the United States is a highly developed country, what criteria am I using to give it that evaluation? When I say Nigeria or India is a less developed country, what, what exactly do I mean? Uh, and there's a couple of different ways that you could evaluate an economy. One way would be to just look at the GDP, which is a measurement of the overall amount of profits that uh, all of the companies, all the economic activity from your country took in. It's not a very nuanced take. So another way to look at it would be to take the United Nations approach. This is from the United Nations Developmental Program. And they came up with a system called the Human Development Index, the HDI. And it considers a couple of different things. Number one, they consider knowledge, which is uh, they're evaluating as the mean or average expected years of schooling. So how long does the average citizen in that country or the average person in that country 
uh, go to school for, right? What is their overall educational background? That's one thing that they factor in. Number two, long, healthy lives. They feel like a well-developed economy, a well-developed country should have knowledgeable citizens that are living long, healthy lives. So I mentioned the United States, our life expectancy is somewhere around 77, 78 years. Uh, in uh, Chad, the country with the lowest life expectancy, it's about 49 years, or at least it was when I grabbed this data. Monaco, the life expectancy is about 89 years. The reason for that is most likely that Monaco is a very wealthy country for how small it is. And as a result, healthcare is pretty good. As long as we're talking about lifespans, here is uh, some countries' lifespans. Over uh, the last uh, century or so, uh, a little bit longer, 150 years or so, uh, since 1880, and you can see that globally, lifespans have been uh, increasing. The, the average human lifespan has gotten bigger but they've gotten bigger in some countries more so than others. So you can see Norway has a really uh, long lifespan, over 80 years. A lot of other high-income countries have uh, over 80-year lifespans. The United States is almost at that threshold. You have China here, some middle-income countries, moderately developed economies, and then uh, India just below that, and then some of the, the less developed countries, and you have uh, Chad down here. Chad is a country that has is, uh, very low uh, income and also a lot of conflict. So those factors are going to uh, decrease the overall lifespan. On the other hand, this is a chart of child mortality rates over the uh, past hundred years or so, and you can see that they have been dropping worldwide, uh, in particularly in the most developed countries. But again, Chad is on this list and it, that's where the least uh, decrease has been seen. So if the infant mortality rate remains high, then the average lifespan is going to be necessarily low. The third factor that the Human Development Index takes into account, so uh, expected years of schooling for the average person, a uh, long healthy lifespan, what the average life expectancy is, the third thing that it takes into account is, is there a decent standard of living, which it calculates based on gross national income per capita, so divided by the population, adjusted for purchasing power parity. I'm sorry, this is the most economics language heavy portion of the course, I promise. So uh, GDP is probably a measurement of economies that you've heard of before. Some of all of the profits made for all of the companies within uh, within a given country kind of added up to figure out what the total economic activity of that country is. Gross national income is similar, but it also includes the value of foreign investments. Uh, so, so it's a larger number typically. Uh, per capita means that you divide it by the population. Adjusted for purchasing power parity means that a correction was instituted that uses the price of similar kinds of goods in different countries in order to try to determine what the actual value of say a dollar or a, a pound sterling or a franc or a, a ruble or whatever kind of currency is being utilized uh, is based on that. So say this is the price of bread here, this is the price of bread there, this is the price of bread in a third location. And using several different um, price points, you, you make this kind of adjustment. So it takes into account not only what the exchange rate for one kind of currency to another is between two different countries, but also how much actual purchasing power uh, that currency has within the country that it would be utilized in. And in that way, it tries to create a more fair scale for comparing two economies. That's a lot of detail, which you do not require. So the third criteria for the Human Development Index is the gross national income per capita adjusted for PPP. If you just remember gross national income, I am happy with that. So I said that uh, 
One way that you could rate an economy is to just look at its GDP, but you could also use this HDI system, which takes more different types of factors into account. Uh, and if you compare those two, you would find that the United States has the highest GDP in the world, according to the World Bank, but it ranks about 13th for the Human Development Index. The countries with the highest HDI, uh, at least a couple of years ago when I made this slide, was Norway, Switzerland, Australia, Ireland, and Germany. The countries with the lowest HDI, Burundi, Chad, South Sudan, Central African Republic, uh, and Niger. So when I say highly developed countries and less developed countries, uh, this is one sense that I made it in, is countries that have a high score on the Human Development Index and then countries that have a low score on the Human Development Index. And as you move through the demographic transition, your HDI would increase as well because lifespans would increase, average education would increase, and GDP, and by extension, GNI, adjusted for PPP, would also increase as well. So your rating would grow. Oh, hey, look at that. On this next slide, I've just uh, laid out the difference between gross domestic product and G uh, GNI. Uh, gross domestic product, annual economic value of all goods and services produced in a country. Gross national product, or GNI, gross national income, is the GDP plus the net income from foreign investments. The reason why they're explicitly laid out like this is because these are vocabulary words in the learning objectives for you guys to know. But sometimes when someone says less developed country, moderately developed country, or highly developed country, they don't necessarily refer to the Human Development Index or any specific um, index with a numeric rating system. They just mean it has certain qualities associated with it, which they associate with a less developed country or with a more highly developed country, or they have some combination of qualities in between, which would, they would call it therefore a moderately developed country. So uh, this cor this concept correlates with GNP per capita, but it also has to do with transportation networks that are built up in that country. Communication facilities, you know, are there phone lines? Are there cell phone towers uh, built in these countries? Interestingly, uh, in some countries, they are skipping uh, the installation of certain um, like landline type telephone, like running all that wire all over the place because cell phone technology exists, right? You could just install the cell phone towers and that's a lot easier. You get a lot better coverage and a lot easier communication than running all these landlines all over the place. So they can actually skip a step that, um, that for example, we went through during our transition. Uh, energy consumption. What kind of energy resources are available and how much energy is used on a daily basis? Literacy, again, has to do with education and employment or unemployment. That's another uh, criteria. Um, these concepts are sort of used in place of older phrasings uh, where you would say first world country, second world country, third world country. Those terms are deeply inappropriate in most cases because they are Cold War terminology, and first world refers to uh, capitalist democracies uh, that were kind of allied with each other at the time. The second world has to do with uh, communist countries that were under the auspices of uh, Russia at the time, uh, kind of under that sphere of influence. And then the third world were countries that were uh, kind of outside uh, of those two classifications, which typically were the ones that were the least developed, which is why we have that association. But the terms refer to political divisions that are often no longer appropriate, whereas what we actually want to describe are the socioeconomic conditions found there. All right, so on the next slide, I have the country of Nepal's flag. It's a great flag, incidentally. Every other country said we're going to do a rectangle. Nepal said, nah, we're going to do a couple of triangles on our flag. Uh, and here are some characteristics of Nepal, and this kind of classifies it as a less developed country. It also has a very low uh, human development index score, so those two things are kind of correlated with each other. Mostly subsistence farming, uh, so on the demographic transition, pre-industrial, 
high infant mortality rate, inadequate medical facilities, low literacy rate, high unemployment rate, very low uh, per capita GNP, low energy consumption and, and production, large percentage of the population is under 15. That implies that the population is rapidly growing, that it's, it's a uh, population with a high growth rate. Poorly developed trade and transportation includes, uh, and these uh, criteria also apply to many African and Asian countries. Not all, obviously. And in some countries where these uh, criteria do apply, there are some sections that are extremely economically developed. Uh, this is an interesting phenomenon that occurs now that uh, we have all this technology that exists, but it's not evenly distributed. By contrast, here are some countries with some relatively high Human Development Index scores. Uh, put the uh, American Betsy Ross flag up there just because I'm very fond of that flag. Uh, and here are the characteristics kind of associate with that. Extensive trade and low unemployment rates. Uh, we talk about the unemployment rate in this country uh, a lot, but compared to a less developed country, it's very low. Uh, high per capita GNP politically stable. Again, maybe it doesn't seem like that because of the way we discuss politics in this country, but we have had transitions of power in this country which occur because someone won an election and then the, the person who was in power is removed from office and the next person comes in and not because someone uh, built up a military force and ejected another person by force from the office. In countries rife with conflict, that kind of a coup is much more common. For someone to even attempt something like that in the United States is exceedingly rare. Low population growth, highly developed transportation networks and internal communication systems, so railways, airports, road systems, shipping docks, landline telephones, cell phone networks, uh, other types of communication systems, uh, advanced medical facilities, right? These are characteristics of a highly developed economy or of a highly developed country. High energy production and consumption, we definitely have that in the United States, and high consumption of resources and production of waste. This is sort of the double-edged sword. The further you make it along the demographic transition, your population growth will decrease, but your per capita resource use will also increase. So what's a moderately developed country? It's a country that has characteristics from both of those lists, such that it doesn't feel appropriate to call it a less developed country, but it still has enough qualities in common with a less developed country that it maybe doesn't make it all the way onto the list of some of the more highly developed countries. It doesn't have very high HDI, comparatively speaking. Uh, so Brazil, Mexico, and Saudi Arabia might be good candidates to put onto that list. Okay. Last topic for Unit 3 is about conflict. Specifically, we're talking about war and things like that. The learning objectives here are actually a little bit vague about what specifically we need to discuss in regards to conflict, but it does say uh, the ways in which conflict affect ecosystems, biodiversity, and I expect also the demographic transition, and I can certainly say a few things about that. So one of the factors that we looked at with whether a country is a less developed country or a highly developed country is, is it politically stable? If you have an area that is in high conflict where there's a lot of military operations constantly coming in, there, there's different um, networks and, and groups coming in grabbing for power or, or fighting over territory or anything like this, that is inherently politically unstable. So a lot of less developed countries have quite a bit of conflict. Warfare makes trade, employment, infrastructure, political stability, education, and agriculture very difficult. Uh, it should be pretty obvious why. Um, it's very difficult to get trade partners if uh, you are in an area where it is dangerous for people to come and trade with you. It is also very difficult to uh, build up a stock of uh, goods in, say, a warehouse if that warehouse could be a target for, say, a uh, bombing operation or something like that, or to have a trade caravan that could also be attacked or looted by uh, combatants uh, of from one side or another. 
infrastructure is very difficult to maintain if there is constantly military vehicles coming through or again explosives and things like that uh, destroying it. For similar reasons it's hard to have the infrastructure required to get a school running but not only that it is very difficult for children to be able to learn if they are in a state of constant anxiety. So all these things are very difficult. Uh, agriculture crops are sometimes burned during warfare, or they're destroyed by uh, troop movements over the over the fields, uh, and this kind of thing. So frequent conflict very strongly can inhibit the demographic transition, and it can wreak havoc with the local ecology. Military tactics can also directly affect civilian populations and the environment, literally destroying ecosystems. Uh, you can think back to uh, Vietnam, where we used uh, defoliating agents to uh, try to strip away all of the cover in, in the jungle. We, we would spray these, um, these chemicals all over the forest from airplanes in order to, to kill all the leaves, to kill all the plants, and uh, basically destroy the ecosystem in order to create fewer places to be able to hide. Those chemicals were extremely toxic. Um, they... They, ha they wreaked havoc with the ecosystem, obviously, because just tons of herbicides being dumped all over the place. They, there is evidence that they have increased the rates of cancer, not only in animal populations, but also in human populations in those localities. Which brings us to damaging public health, depleting natural resources. Wars require a lot of energy. They require a lot of material in order to keep them going and creating refugees. People with nowhere to go who need to go somewhere in order to receive succor, so they migrate sometimes long distances in order to try to seek safe harbor in another country which may or may not be receptive to receiving those refugees. To demonstrate how conflict can lead to environmental damage, uh, I'll talk about this incident that occurred in 1991 when Iraq was occupying an area of Kuwait largely because of the oil reserves there. The Gulf War was had a lot to do with oil. Uh, and when uh, American troops were coming in, they, they fled that area, but rather than let anyone else be able to utilize that energy resource, the oil, they set fire to 650 oil wells in those fields. And these aren't barrels of oil. These aren't tankers of oil. These are the oil wells where, where the oil is being extracted up from the ground. So those oil wells burned for 10 months, leading to over $22 billion in damage and massive pollution. So we have poisonous smoke clouds emerging from these. These are photos uh, from, from that uh, incident. Uh, massive amounts of soot and ash being kicked up into the atmosphere and giant lakes of oil spilling out over to the land, ending up in some of the waterways and things like that. As of 2012, an estimated 1 million barrels still remain in the environment. And then on the next slide, I have satellite imagery uh, showing the same stretch of land before, during the burn, and then after the burn, so you can see the giant greasy uh, oil mark the burn left behind. And down here, see this little white bar here? That's a five mile distance. So you can appreciate how massive, massive this, this blackened area here is on the map. So conflict can absolutely end up leading to massive uh, environmental damage. I already mentioned defoliating agents, so uh, 20 million gallons of Agent Orange uh, and other herbicides were sprayed in Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos, destroying about 5.5 million acres of forest and cropland, and some areas remain polluted today. Uh, the constituents of Agent Orange are capable of producing chromosomal aberrations, that's mutations, in some mammals, which then can lead to cancer and birth defects, which we are seeing in higher frequencies in those populations. Probably the most profound example of the destructive potential of conflicts is nuclear weapons, which have been used just twice uh, in active warfare. They've been tested many times more than that, but they've been utilized just twice against um, civilian populations. These bombs can 
decimate, that literally obliterate uh, anything uh, around the fireball zone that, that's going to be detonated. And the uh, destruction goes for miles uh, around the actual explosion. The, uh, the bombs also emit large amounts of radioactive fallout into the environment. Um, that is fragments of radioactive material that remains radioactive for some time after. Depending on the type of bomb, uh, the danger of that is going to be different. Radiation leads to higher incidences of mutation, which can lead to birth defects and cancer, much like the Agent Orange I was talking about just a moment ago. And a lot of the deaths of a nuclear bomb occur post-detonation. This gentleman here, whose name is Tsutomu Yamaguchi, uh, he was actually at Hiroshima the, the day the first bomb was dropped. He was an engineer working for Mitsubishi, uh, and he was going to work. He was on his way into the office, and he was running a little bit late. That turned out to be good news, because uh, if he had been on time, he would have probably been closer to the blast. But he was a little bit late, so he was a little bit uh, outside uh, of the more dangerous zone. He did get hit with the shockwave, knocked up against a wall, lost consciousness, got a massive dose of radiation poisoning. Um, a traumatizing experience. He experienced the, saw the whole thing go off like a blinding light. Uh, all these things had to crawl over. Um, all, all of the people in the streets that, you know, that died from the blast, I'm sure ash falling down from the sky, eventually made his way to a train, uh, and he, he got out of there. And he managed uh, to get his way home, because uh, he didn't live in Hiroshima. He, he managed to get his way home to where he lived in Nagasaki, and Nagasaki is where we dropped the second bomb days later. So he's uh, perhaps the only person who is confirmed to have been present at both nuclear detonations uh, in history uh, that have ever been used in wartime. Now, as I understand it, the radiation poison that he received did lead to extreme agony, uh, but he did live uh, for a very long time. He died at the age of 93, so, so he survived a very long time. Now, as I understand it, the radiation levels at uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima, if you were going to there today, it's similar to what you would get to any location that had not had a nuclear bomb detonated at it. Like I said, it's the type of nuclear device that is detonated that also has an influence as to what type of fallout is created, and, and those were not. But this does give you a window into the sheer amount of energy that nuclear technology has available. Uh, and in Unit 4, we are going to talk about energy resources. One of them is going to be nuclear technology, which uses a similar kind of reaction, but in a much more controlled way. And I'll argue that it's a safe technology. However, this should give you context as to why a lot of people are reluctant to embrace that technology. And there are other drawbacks associated with it as well. Every single energy technology that I describe, I will talk about its pros and cons. But that's material for Unit 4, which I hope you all look forward to starting next week.